coming up and making themselves comfortable up here. Uh, I want to second uh, the emotion when it comes to Seattle. When the sun is out, there's no place that's better. <laughs> and when it's cloudy, well, that just gives you a good excuse to hunker down at your computer and work or come to a conference like this one. If you haven't been to Seattle before, I'd recommend seeing the Space Needle and the Pacific Science Center. You can go down to the Museum of Flight down by Boeing Field and take the Boeing factory tour and everything. It's not just because they're cool tourist sites, it's also because those places will give you a sense of Seattle's heritage as a hotspot for aviation and aerospace. I'd argue that Boeing's century-old connection to things that fly and the 21st century vision that was laid out in 1962 during the World's Fair are uniquely Seattle signatures. They're also among the reasons why Seattle is a great place for looking ahead to the new space economy, as well as looking back at the old space legacy. Another factor is the influence of companies like Amazon and Microsoft. Seattle's leading role in software development and cloud computing has made this region a magnet for data-centric startups. And if you learn anything in the next few days, I hope you'll learn how space ventures are becoming increasingly all about the data. Speaking of Amazon and Microsoft, I have to mention that some of the folks who made their fortunes in the dot-com world are spending some of that money to turn their personal visions of spaceflight into realities. Amazon founder Jeff Bezos is the founder of Blue Origin as well, and we're glad to have Blue Origin's president, Rob Meyerson, with us today. Microsoft co-founder Paul Allen created Vulcan Aerospace and Stratolog Systems, as you just heard, and he's funding spaceflight industries as well. Today, we're going to hear again from Chuck Beams, president of Vulcan Aerospace and executive director of Strata Launch Systems. And we're also going to hear from Jason Andrews, CEO of Space Flight Industries. One of Microsoft's most brilliant software developers, Charles Simony, went on to become another billionaire and a space flyer who took not just one, but two trips to the International Space Station. Simony is also one of the founding investors in Planetary Resources, and so we're really glad to have Chris Lewicki, President and CEO of Planetary Resources, on our panel today. Aerojet Rocketdyne's operation in Redmond, Washington, is arguably one of the Seattle area's oldest space ventures. It started up in the 1950s when some engineers from Boeing broke away to create a company called Rocket Research. Over the years, there have been name changes and acquisitions, and today that Redmond operation is part of Aerojet, Aerojet Rocketdyne, but its status as one of the country's top centers for space propulsion is unchanged. Fred Wilson, Director of Business Development for Aerojet Rocketdyne in Redmond, rounds out today's panel. Well, I could go on and on about our panelists' resumes and achievements, but we've only got an hour, and so I'll trust these guys to tell you what you need to know about them and their companies uh, and their uniquely Seattle spin. You can also see a lot more information about their backgrounds in your program. So let's start in alphabetical order with Jason Andrews, CEO of Space Flight Industries. Feel free to stand or sit, uh, whatever you like. Sure. Hey, welcome to Seattle. Seattle did what's up. No, it is great to be here. I'm actually born and raised in this area, with the University of Washington. So of all the panelists here, uh, I think I you know, can trace my roots back the farthest in Seattle. And it's actually really exciting to have new space here. Uh, there, you know, there was a discussion about how we raise the visibility of space, the space industry here. You know, we're kind of the, the smaller step brother of the Boeing Corporation and everything's of airplanes. But really, there's a, a really cool, vibrant space activity. Uh, so I actually, right out of school, started an aerospace company called Kistler Aerospace. In fact, uh, this is mid-1990s, before there was SpaceX, there was Kistler. You know, we were on the floor above Telesic, and we were helping darken the skies with satellites the first time around, 20 years ago. Um, and actually share an office with Rob here, so I think many local companies can actually trace their roots back 
to Kiss the Aerospace. Uh, in that same office was Deborah Bakley Borg, who's out there in the audience and works at Ball currently, but also worked at Air Launch and a few other things. But uh, along the way, uh, I ended up starting my first company, Andrew Space, in 1999. We actually started in Southern California, uh, but moved back here because of, the, quite frankly, the quality of life. So we're we're yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, quality of life was better here than in Southern California. And, and in many ways, uh, for those who were here a year ago, Elon came up here and announced that they were opening an office. And what he said was, I've been trying to recruit you software people down to Southern California for the last six years and no one will move. So I'm coming to you finally, and I'm opening an office right on the, the back door of Microsoft and, and Xbox. So uh, I think it's working out for him. Uh, but it's really exciting. And you know, today with space flight industries, we have really two lines of business. One is space flight, uh, where we're launching the small satellite revolution, both literally and figuratively. Uh, we build small satellites. Uh, access to space was a problem, as, as Chuck talked about earlier. We started a company called Space Flight. It's really a rideshare business, but it's evolved much more than that. Uh, it's gone from $100,000 missions to single million dollar missions to 10, $20 million missions, and then last year we purchased a Falcon 9. Uh, we're really excited about that flying next year. In fact, we're actually flying this evening. Uh, we have 12 payloads on the Indian PSLV, and so the launch is at 8.55, and we're trying to have it on the screen at the party, so um, we'll see how that goes from a technical. You know, it's India, so we're going to go all around the planet to, to get that, uh, show that thing for everybody who wanted to show up. Uh, but along the way, we also started, I guess I'm a serial entrepreneur, I started several companies, uh, and started Black Sky. What Black Sky is, just like you can own a car, you can lease a car. We were building small imaging satellites for the US government, and we realized that there's just geospatial revolution going on. Um, and so we were building the satellites and putting them on orbit for everybody to use. And what our real goal is to fundamentally transform how we look at our planet so that we can now look at it in real time. Our vision is you can task it from your phone, get it back in 90 minutes for $90. And when we do that, we'll fundamentally transform and democratize access to the planet, how we look at it. So that you as individuals or corporations, you know, this is something that's only been in the domain of some Western governments. Now everybody has access to that for humanitarian reasons, and we partner with the United Nations on that, uh, for commercial reasons, uh, but for all sorts of good uh, causes. So we're actually launching our first spacecraft in, in August now uh, for Black Sky, and we're excited to be in Seattle. Uh, we relocated back here in, in 2001. We've had a number of different offices. Uh, ironically, uh, we were in the Vulcan building from 2003 to 2010 on the third floor. We never went upstairs to talk to Paul Allen. It was only after we left that he became an investor in Vulcan. And I have to laugh because Chuck, I went and visited him a couple weeks ago, we went down to his office, and they actually have the same office space we had uh, back in the day. So Chuck's office and my office were one apart, just 10 years removed. Um, so it's a small community. Uh, Seattle's a great place. And ultimately, I think it really is unique here because uh, of the visionary people. It's the, the pioneering culture that Seattle's had since the very beginning. Uh, but really, if you think about the future and space, you need access to three things. Really, it's about software, it's about big data, and it's about capital. And Seattle's an epicenter for all three. So I invite all of you to consider, as you're starting your company, to, to come up here to Seattle. Um, this is the first time I've ever been able to sleep in my own bed and go to a space conference, so I was really excited. <laughs> and we love to continue with this. So with that, I probably said enough. Thank you very much to Alan and everybody, and I look forward to seeing you throughout the course of the week. Thank you. Okay, now we've got a reprise from Chuck Beams, uh, president of Vulcan Aerospace. All right, well, um, since you've already heard enough from me, I think what I what I, I have is a, is kind of a fun little uh, movie little video clip. It's kind of fun to watch, and then uh, and I'm then uh, a little slide I just want to give off of my perspective um, on the from a, the Seattle. So I think roll the video. By the end of this decade. Spacecraft in orbit. You don't see the perspective. You don't appreciate what the wingspan of 385 feet actually looks like. Strata Launch will build an air launch system to give us orbital access to space with greater safety, flexibility, and cost effectiveness.
so uh, stay tuned. There'll be lots of announcements coming on that. Um, I, I asked uh, the, the uh, Space Frontier Foundation that just put together a slide of the, of the, the companies in the Seattle, the space companies in the Seattle area. And uh, this is what I got. But you know, what's interesting about this is that this is, this is really only a handful. And, and um, there, there are literally, there, there, there's just so many that, that are, are small. And, and, and I know this, again, as I talked about before, because of our, our investment structure and, and all that. So I need, I need a lot of these um, uh, new uh, startup CEOs and stuff. And it's, it is just a fascinating, fascinating culture. It's just unbelievably entrepreneurial. And, um, and when I look back, I, I actually, some friends might know, I grew up in Silicon Valley. Uh, so I was, I was a kid in the 70s and 80s in Silicon Valley when, when that whole thing was kind of getting going. And, uh, and then, so that revolution happens. The money, you know, just tremendous wealth is, is created. Um, and then it, then it spawns a lot of, actually, this the new space thing. And, and, and then uh, what's interesting is so that the, the tech, what we call now tech, but the sort of Silicon Valley whole thing kind of started in there and moved up to Seattle. And I sort of see a similar trend going on with space. Really, a lot of, a huge part of the cradle of space was actually in Southern California. Um, and, and I see a very similar trend going on, almost, it's almost uncanny, it's going on here in Seattle, and I, th I don't think it's by accident, I think it's because of the just remarkable, and it's everything from restaurants, I've never seen so many um, restaurant startups in Seattle, for a relatively small city, and, and, and just unbelievably awesome food, so I would love to eat, so I had to <laughs> um, so I, it's exciting. I love being here. I completely fall in love with Seattle, and uh, and so I'm not I'm not a guy that's been around for generations like Jason. But uh, it's great to call uh, all all the folks that I've met here, friend. And, and uh, anyway, so that's my perspective on on this whole thing. Thanks, Thanks Chuck. And, and we're going to try to leave lots of room for questions because. Uh, you don't get a chance like this very often to have five leaders of the space community, not just in Seattle, but, but in the country up here like this. And so uh, next we'll hear from Rob Myerson. No, Chris Lewicki, sorry. Chris Lewicki. <laughs> See, so much talent I'm even getting confused. Chris Lewicki, President and CEO of Planetary Resources. Good morning, everyone. Uh, also very excited to see a sold out room. I hear that the hotel is out of chairs. Uh, so I was describing to uh, uh, Hannah Kerner and Jeff Huggy earlier that uh, this is part of the program to, to really prepare your body for the rigors of space and uh, the force to stand up desks. So um, uh, I'm the CEO of Chief Asteroid Miner, uh, President at uh, Planetary Resources. I think a lot of people are probably familiar with our very audacious vision and vision, uh, which is which is a brief one, but, but expansive. And that is to take the economy that we enjoy on this planet and help spread that economy elsewhere. And we think that the resources in space are a key building block in doing that. We're seeing access to space, of course, uh, transform, uh, going from uh, government players to commercial players, looking at reasonability and efficiency in doing that. And again, so many of these solutions that are coming online really to, to meet the great demand. And uh, what we're, we're, also, we're seeing on top of that, of course, is the resurgence of applications to take advantage of access to space. And uh, we populated low Earth orbit, medium Earth orbit, and, and geo with uh, all the business environment that we have. And we might see it even beyond that. And that will take resources and a lot of really what gives a Seattle. Whether it's back to Lewis and Clark exploring the resources that are out here, uh, or being able to live off the land with all the great resources that are up here uh, in this corner of the country. And when we go into space, it will be much the same. Uh, we will need the very basic essence of life, oxygen to breathe, water uh, to support our lives and livelihood, uh, materials to support manufacturing, uh, whether that is, again, water or easy things like metal, to be able to create structures in space. Uh, so that we can launch, you know, only the important stuff, and we can uh, really accelerate our growth by using using the space and the machines and the talent and the uh, the human brain. 
So as planetary resources, what we really are doing is in the mining industry. over here, or move this to a better radio free zone. Can I talk to you about electromagnetic compatibility and interference? <laughs> <laughs> a very space problem. That's too much of a nerd joke. I'm working on this. <laughs> <laughs> the, the planetary resources staff here are probably grounding because I could go on for a few minutes with nerd jokes. <laughs> so uh, with, uh, with what we're deploying in the technology resources, our, our vision, of course, sort of got very audacious with the idea of uh, exploring space, finding resources, and really beginning the development of those resources in a way that helps us take those very brief steps to overnight uh, turn space into a place where we live, work, and operate. And there's really just a part that, uh, like this city, was, was not here uh, 150 years ago. Uh, and uh, you know, now it is uh, one of the hubs of technology, uh, investment, finance, and space in the world. And uh, there's no reason that uh, in less time uh, we can't make a destination off this planet be that very same thing. Uh, so uh, we too are taking advantage of a lot of the innovations, uh, not only in information technology and mobile computing, industrial uh, hardware, and assembling it in a way that we think is key for being able to sustainably uh, explore the resources in space, characterize those resources, put a value on them, understand what the next step to take is, not finding out you know, why we're all here and what is the age of the solar system, but how do I use this carbonaceous asteroid? How do I develop the resources on it? How can I be confident that what I'm measuring is true and is the, the right amount of material that's out there? And in doing this, we've not only developed a platform that we can get out into deep space, uh, hundreds of millions of kilometers away from Earth uh, in the harsh radiation environment of space using autonomous systems and, and deep space communication technology and distributed compute systems, uh, but we've also brought into play uh, key sensors which are important to measure the composition of an asteroid, to look at hydrated minerals uh, in the presence of water, to look at the thermal signature and thermal inertias of an asteroid, and to use technologies like hyperspectral imaging to be able to look at a pixel of light uh, and from that single piece of information understand a little bit of insight of the composition of what we're looking for and how we might be able to use that. And uh, we announced uh, actually just a few weeks ago after uh, raising uh, our first venture round of financing that we're deploying that technology uh, in the coming years in Earth orbit uh, in the Ceres constellation named both after the very first asteroid uh, that was ever discovered, but uh, that asteroid also happens to be named after the Roman goddess, god of harvest. Uh, and one key uh, application that we found in this technology to characterize water on asteroids is the ability to manage our own resources right here on this planet, uh, starting with things like precision agriculture. So the measurements that we use to understand water in an asteroid can actually help us understand water in global agriculture and uh, how that relates to efficiently using our resources and being able to optimize uh, for crops. So in our partnership with Bayer Crop Science, uh, we're really excited about taking asteroid mining technology and bringing it all the way back to agriculture. And a lot of this is, there's a lot of companies that are, are finding applications like this. And, you know, we, in the uh, chat we're talking about, uh, uh, in the evolution of PCs, we saw uh, the emergence of all sorts of new applications and hundreds of different companies, not only from software but hardware, uh, really looking for uh, the different applications that are enabled by making this technology more accessible. So at the end of the day, that's what we're excited to be a part of here in Seattle. Uh, very excited uh, to have this uh, here uh, in our hometown. And I think on the panel, we'll discuss a little bit more about what makes Seattle special uh, in doing this. So. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Now I'm pleased to introduce Rob Myerson, Professor of Blue Origin. And, and before now. So, thank Chris. Uh, thank, you, thank you, Alan. Thanks, everyone, for being here today. Um, and I'm uh, really happy to be on this panel. I've been with Blue Origin since 2003, so 13 years now. Um, and uh, just love, love being in Seattle. Uh, really enjoy uh, the, the location here. Um, the uh, one thing I just wanted to, you know, talk about Boeing celebrating its 100-year anniversary this year. Big shout out to the Boeing, to the Boeing folks. They, they uh, um, there's a reason why companies that are admired like Boeing, you know, locate here in Seattle. It's a, it's a unique place. It's a beautiful place to live. Uh, it's a very, very intelligent community. Uh, high, high rate of STEM education. A very literate uh, group here. Uh, so, so that, that's that's the reason why, you know, why do space companies come here? Because so many companies before us have come and made this a, a really, really fantastic place when you combine it with the, the natural resources around us. In addition to Boeing, of course, companies like Amazon.com, Microsoft, 
Nordstrom, as Chuck mentioned, REI, Starbucks. Um, so if you're in the Seattle year-round, you need your Starbucks stuff. You need your <laughs> so, uh, and you'll enjoy that while you're here. Um, there's a lot of things that are really unique about Seattle, and I want to kind of share some of those. I'm, I've been here for 19 years. I'm not a native, like Jason, but, uh, but I'm close. How's that? Um, <laughs> the, uh, um, if, you're, if you've been here this long, you remember a few things. You remember Almost Live, which is uh, our Seattle version of, of, of Saturday Night Live. Um, you know uh, probably what I mean by uh, sandal chic. Um, wearing your sandals around with shorts and maybe a hooded sweatshirt. If you're a dad like me, you might throw in some socks. And, uh, and you look really good doing it. I keep convincing my kid that. Um, you know what it means when someone says there's a mountain out today. Um, and, you, and you get to go, go take a look at that. And it's, if you haven't seen Mount Rainier, go, go take a look. Um, you also don't know what sunshine slowdowns means when you hear that on the radio. The sun's out, the traffic is slowed by, it's not because of the rain or something else. It's the sun. <laughs> so, uh, um, so uh, all right. <laughs> um, so, so, I just, uh, you know, being here, um, when, when New Space announced that they were coming to Seattle, I was really excited about it. Not just because I got to go to a conference and, you know, stay and go home at night, um, but also just because of bringing everyone here and sharing this, this special place with, with everybody here. Um, I think when the when New Space and Space Frontier Foundation made this decision, it, was, it wasn't you know like a, a home run. This was a this was a risk. And talking with Jeff Ivey and the team, uh, I think it's paid off for you. I'm really excited that, that we've got a great great attendance here today. Um, but when they made this announcement, you know, now I'll talk about Blue Origin. Nobody had ever launched a rocket to space and landed it back on Earth. That had never happened before. Um, now it's been done uh, a number of times by both Blue Origin and, and SpaceX. Um, nobody ever taken that rocket and flown it again. Um, uh, demonstrating reuse, which, uh, which I'm really personally very proud of. So I'm excited to share about these things about uh, um, with you in my keynote. I've got just one chart, you know, when, when New Space announced they were coming to Seattle, Blue Forge was about 450 people. We're now about 700 people and growing uh, to meet, you know, meet the needs of our B4 program and our orbital launch program. Um, you know, the, there's a picture of our, our lobby. Um, I couldn't think of a cooler place to to come to work. Um, it is, uh, it's inspiring to look around and see the Enterprise in the lobby and the Jules Verne rocket we have, have right there. We got to share that with Alan Boyle recently. So, uh, um, but you know, with the long-term vision of millions of people living and working in space, it's going to take, you know, this entire community. We're not going to do it alone. Uh, no one company is going to take that on alone. So we're trying to do our part and, uh, and I just, just want to say I'm happy to be here. So look forward to your questions. Thank you. after lunch today, so it'll be fantastic. And uh, Fred Wilson is the Director of Business Development at Aerojet Rocket Dine, and I'm pleased to have him uh, talk about his company and uh, his Seattle spin. Thank you. Well, I'm excited to be here, and uh, I also have a long history in the Seattle area. I moved up here in 1983 to work at Boeing Space Center in Kent, and actually uh, worked with uh, Jason's dad, Dana, uh, at that facility. So I'm going to stick to the uh, uniquely Seattle theme and, and talk about some of the things that are unique about what, what we do at the facility in Redmond, Washington. Um, some things that uh, many of you may not be aware that uh, this factory in Redmond, we've delivered uh, more rocket engines out of this site than any other uh, company in the world. So we do a, a lot of volume of space business at this facility. Uh, we've delivered rocket engines that have been to all, all the planets in the solar system. We've delivered uh, rocket engines that have been a part of every uh, moon and Mars landing. And now with Voyager exiting the solar system, we've got rocket engines that uh, have, have exited our solar system. And we like to say we've got the first interstellar uh, propulsion system, at least that we know about. Uh, <laughs> so this is a picture of our factory. It's uh, near the same Shell Winery in, in Redmond. We've got over 400 employees at this site, and uh, we're, we're focused on the in-space propulsion uh, product area. I've got just a little history of, of what we do here. Uh, we were founded by four Boeing engineers back in 1959. We didn't always have such nice facilities as our original facility in South Park, uh, down near Boeing Field, where, where the company got started. We got our first major rocket engine program in 1966, and then uh, 
moved out to Rendon in 1967. We've been out there uh, ever since, so almost 50 years of that. Rendon site, we became part of the Aerojet Rocket 9 family in 2002. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, we're, the, we're the industry leader for in space propulsion, delivered over 15,000 rocket engines out of that site. And a uh, key part of our success over the years has been that we've been a uh, key innovator, uh, leading in innovator in in-space propulsion. And uh, this is just a little collage of some of the different uh, flight programs we've been a part of over the years. Going back to the original trans-stage program, developing uh, reaction control engines for the Titan vehicle, and then all the way through the original Viking lander program, the original Voyager program. GPS, uh, Chuck was talking a little, little bit about how GPS has changed people's lives. We started working on GPS in the 1970s. There's been five blocks of that program, and we've had the engines on every single satellite in that, over 150 satellites and over 2,000 of our engines. So that's been a big program over the years, and we're right now supplying the engines for the GPS-3 uh, constellation. Space Shuttle was a huge program for us uh, over the 30 years that it was going. We had over 40 engines across that vehicle. And, uh, and at the bottom there in the center, uh, the commercial satellite business is our single largest market area in Redden. We're on board all of the satellite manufacturers in the US, uh, Europe, and Japan. So that's a high volume of business we do out of there. Uh, probably the, one of the most exciting things we're, we're doing at Redmond now on the top right there is the electric propulsion, and that's a key, been a key growth area for us in really changing the economies of space. Uh, this, uh, in 2010, we had the first all-electric orbit raising for a GeoComSat. Uh, that's really a game changer up until uh, recently when we were launching satellites, we were primarily launching propellant, and now uh, with a factor of 10 increase in, in engine performance, we're primarily launching payloads. So that's, it's really a, a huge game changer for the industry and, and uh, a lot of that uh, leading innovation has come out of that facility in Redmond. Mars Curiosity landing in 2012 was a very exciting event for us and uh, we'll have another one of those coming up in 2020. Most, recent, most recently, the Pluto New Horizons mission uh, got a lot of press, and uh, we had all of the propulsion uh, on board that spacecraft. So a lot of things we did, this just shows all the different uh, missions we've been to in the solar system, and all the different uh, planet missions and uh, outer, inner and outer planet and asteroid missions. So it uh, gives you a flavor of all the different uh, places we've been to in the solar system. And these are some of the uh, next things that are coming up for us. Uh, Juno is, uh, you're going to see a lot of press about that in the coming days. Uh, it's arriving at Jupiter uh, over the July 4th weekend. And we have all 12 rocket engines on that spacecraft. Uh, and then OSIRIS-REx is going to launch in September. It's going to be the first US mission to carry samples uh, from an asteroid back to Earth. Uh, very relevant uh, planetary resources, guys. Uh, we've got 22 engines on that. So uh, a lot of exciting stuff are reading next. We just recently completed delivering 700 uh, rocket engines for that program, and those are all uh, getting delivered to the launch site here over the coming months, and they'll start their launches in September, extending through 2017. Basically, every month we've got several spacecraft launching with uh, rocket engines out of the, the Redmond facility. So. Uh, Got a few topics in here, which I think you're, you're going to be some of your key questions. I think I'll, I'll defer to those. No, no, go, go ahead and go through that. Okay, so, so why, why are we located in Seattle? Well, the obvious question for us, we had four founders that uh, spun off from Boeing and, and started our company, so they were keen to stay in the Seattle area, and, and that was the origin there. But I do want to uh, emphasize that I think Boeing and the space, the aerospace engineering pool that Boeing brought to the Seattle area was a key spawning ground for space companies uh, in the Seattle area, and, and there's a lot of ex-Boeing engineers at various different companies and space companies in the Seattle area. We also now, having been uh, in the Seattle area for close to 60 years, We've spawned off a lot of engineers to do companies in the Seattle area. In fact, I think uh, many of the companies up here on the stage uh, have company have employees that have uh, come from uh, our Redmond site. The uh, other key contributor, I think, is the large uh, software and tech uh, 
resources that have uh, emerged in the Seattle area over the last 20 plus years. And uh, Elon certainly cited that as one of the reasons for locating uh, their satellite business up in the Redmond area. I also wanted to share maybe some of the lessons learned for the new space companies from an old space company. Um, you know what? There's a lot of talk of new space versus old space, but I think the, uh, the key uh, relevant thing to me is, is innovating versus stagnating. And, and the companies that are successful innovators uh, successfully grow over the years. And, um, you know, there's a lot of new space entrants that have come into the space business over the last 30 years, and very few of those are still around. Um, and likewise, not many of the current new space companies are, are not going to be around in 10 to 20 years. It's, it's the successful innovators that grow over time, and even though you know, we've been around for 50, 60 years, if we quit innovating, we're not going to be around much longer. We're pretty fortunate that over the last year, we've won three of the largest uh, new NASA technology programs that have been awarded. So I think we're positioning ourselves well for the future. Uh, but that's a, I think the key lesson learned, uh, for me, challenges to watch out for. One of, the, one of the negatives associated with the growth of the space business in the Seattle area is the competition for resources, which uh, we've, you know, we've lost a number of people to new startups in the Seattle area. But I think overall, that's a that big positive for, for our industry and for the Seattle area. We've got a much more robust space uh, employment environment now. Uh, we're much less susceptible to the things, uh, the reductions like Boeing had in the 70s where, you know, they wanted to turn the light, last person out to turn the lights off in Seattle. Uh, Boeing, you know, has announced they're going to be reducing their workforce uh, over the next several months. And uh, I think actually a lot of us are excited about that because uh, those of us that are hiring are eager to get, get people. So um, I think we're... We're in a much better position to handle those kind of uh, adjustments within individual companies. That's all I have there. Thank you. Like I said, I did want to leave lots of time for questions, but uh, maybe one question I'll throw out for the panel is uh, where does Seattle fit into the long-term space ecosystem? I, I think, as I mentioned in a story I wrote about this, there's not going to be any launch pad nearby, and uh, there's no NASA center, so you don't have that to fall back on. Uh, are there limitations to how Seattle fits into the space industry, and uh, or are there synergies with other clusters? You know, clusters is a, is a big uh, buzzword right now. So uh, do you see ways that Seattle fits in with other space clusters, or are you competing? Just thought I'd throw that out as, as my single question, and then we'll get to your questions. Can we go? Well, sure, I'll, I'll take the first guy, and we'll chime in. You know, I, I think um, when we were talking about getting the conference up here, it was really made, it's one to highlight this industry, um, what we have going on here, and also to help them in recruiting, because all of us here are hiring on this panel, you know, and we need more resources. So, uh, this was a little bit of a self-serving activity, uh, but at the same time, we're super excited you're here. And I think the reason, though, is because the personalities in the Northwest is actually not to, to beat our chest, we're pretty humble people, and, but what that means is I think there's a lot more going on here than people realized. Um, and as, as some of us were talking about this, really as we see it, there's three revolutions going on right now. There's this geospatial revolution where we're going to darken the skies with small satellites to look at the planet in real time. And I think that's mostly a West Coast thing right now. Clearly, we have ourselves a black sky, we have planetary resources, we have planet depth labs down in the Bay Area along with Carvella and others who are working on that. But the other real revolution is wiring up the last four billion people on the planet. Um, we have a, a pioneering spirit in telecommunications here as, as a company. We're not involved, at least from the standpoint of launch, we could be. But uh, you know, we have Cost Cellular turned into AT&T Wireless. We have T-Mobile here. We have a, a large telecommunications uh, environment here, and ultimately that led to Teledesic 20 years ago. And ultimately, that's part of why Elon's here doing his communications activity. Um, so I think Seattle is a, a, an epicenter for that. But finally, I think the, the ultimate holy grail, and it goes back to the comments of this conference. It is about creating a permanent human presence in space. And you know, I think three of the companies leading that are here, you know, if you count SpaceX. Obviously, we have Blue Origin and, and what Jeff is investing in. We have what Vulcan is investing in with the Strata Launch and, and Long-Term Visions and Long and also SpaceX. 
So from that standpoint, I think the percentage here because uh, I think you made some very insightful comments. It is about innovation. It is about being pioneers. It's about taking huge risks. And I think you've seen that from a personality standpoint here. So I believe Seattle is really at the beginning of its space growth curve. And, and really, you're going to see, just like in the Valley, the companies here are going to have other entrepreneurs that come and work for five years and spawn off and create new businesses that fill niche markets around this ecosystem that we're creating in Seattle. So I, I believe, just due to what I said before, due to the capital, the people, the resources, the attitude, um, Seattle is going to be on the map for a, for a long time. Sure. If I can I'll just pile on on that. Um, my, my kind of what I made in my, my uh, keynote, keynote um, observations about the innovative culture and all that, and both its position as, as also an, an enabler of, of, of that entrepreneurial thing through investment. And so, and, and what I see is that um, all the companies here are, are either um, are either a part of the revolution itself, or they are enabling it in some in, in another fashion. And um, whether it's space flight carrying all you know all kinds of fascinating cubesats up um, to explore all kinds of different phenomenologies and all that kind of thing. And I think that um, from a Baldwin perspective, and in terms of jobs, the biggest growth is actually going to be all of the startup. Companies, all these uh, new space startups that are, that are highly innovative, that are going to survive, and, and they're going to employ, um, just like any other business, they're going to employ all kinds of uh, people and grow new companies. And that's what's exciting about that. Yeah, I'll add that, you know, there's, um, I can't immediately think of a, of a uh, launch pad anywhere in the world that has a thriving uh, you know, uh, municipality and uh, place you'd like to live right around it. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and, you know, I started my career uh, at uh, NASA's National Propulsion Laboratory, and people for 10 years asked me, well, you know, why did you move to Los Angeles? And, like, because there was a Jet Propulsion Laboratory there. There, there was no other reason I, I wanted to, to work for, for NASA and uh, help explore the solar system uh, and, and got a great education there. But when it, when it came to, uh, to figure out where to build planetary resources, it was a very conscious choice that we came here to Seattle. Uh, and in, uh, in 2010 and 11, when we made that choice, uh, Blue Origin uh, was, was just getting started uh, and um, wasn't sharing a lot at that time. Uh, that's changed a little bit. Uh, you know, uh, SpaceX uh, was really uh, uh, just kind of uh, coming into the, the, uh, the swing of things. Um, and there were, I would call at the time, a lot of these things that were going to Seattle were a little bit weird. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and it wasn't it wasn't mainstream activities. Uh, there, you know, there's uh, you know people who make the math. Tethers Unlimited uh, is a very innovative company in town uh, that started on you know the the idea of uh, using tethered satellite systems, and that spawned all sorts of other things which have nothing to do with tethers, but uh, are all very in innovative. Uh, there's things like beam power energy and the you know space elevator priming competition. Uh, uh, and you know, then there are, there are you know the things that you've never heard about, uh, like we just learned about Aerojet. Uh, but I think uh, <laughs> sorry, uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm trying to be tweeted out right now. <laughs> no one outside this room knows what goes on with the rockets and Redmond. Uh, it's not mainstream, and that and that that's uh, really the thing. You have to be in the business to know what's going on. Um, with uh, I think with you know kind of the next phase idea, what we're seeing is space is no longer the domain of aerospace engineers. Uh, and in fact, it can't be. I mean, you, you'll have a big company uh, that maybe does uh, small contracts for NASA occasionally. Uh, but it's more about the confluence of everything else, the information technologies, the value add, the application, what problem are you actually solving? How are you going to raise capital for it? How does this scale as a business? And at the end of the day, you know, where is the place that uh, it's still the case that it's going to take you two, three, four, five, ten, maybe longer years uh, to build a successful business uh, in the space industry, and you've got to enjoy where you live. And you know, Seattle is spectacular for that. Uh, and I uh, talked to you know a lot of people in other places where they're aerospace, and they're they think it's like, well, I'll be there for a while, and then, then I'll move on to something else. But uh, you know, I think Seattle is really a place where uh, you can build out the business you know till the end of time, and uh, we'll. Uh, we'll eventually get uh, uh, space or when the technology moves beyond uh, combusting fuels. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, I, I don't need to respond to Chris's comment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, but I do think there's there's a, a bootstrap type effect that occurs there. That you know, originally you had Boeing as the aerospace company in Seattle, and, and that spawned off a certain number of, of businesses. But now we've got a growing number of space companies in the Seattle area, a growing employment base, and I think you know that's going to result in this bootstrapping and non-linear growth that I think we're going to see a lot more happening. We've got more venture capital uh, coming into the business, and particularly in this area. So uh, I think the growth opportunities are great in the Seattle area. Yeah. Okay. If I could add uh, one thing uh, you mentioned, Alan, was the, the lack of a NASA center or a lack of a launch pad here in Seattle. Sadly, you know, we can't get on the launch pad here in Seattle, so we'll have enough to fly rockets, but, uh, but hopefully someday we can. Um, without a big NASA government center for research, you, you rely on these companies we talked about that are here, Boeing and, and Microsoft and um, Amazon and all the other companies that are that are in the area. But you also have to rely on a great educational infrastructure to uh, to support the kind of long-term needs you have for resources. And we we certainly have that here in Seattle. You saw the the students from Race Back Aviation High School there here, the number one high school in the state of Washington, which is uh, um, uh, affiliated with the uh, Seattle Museum of Flight, which is a, a world-class educational institution, um, bringing uh, kids in as um, you know youngsters into their ACE camp and watching aerospace scholars and such. And I, I have the pleasure of being on the board of the, of, of the museum there and getting to see what they're doing firsthand, and it's it's just fantastic. And we'll, we'll, those going to game on Thursday will get a chance to see it firsthand as well. Um, and then also our, our, our universities we have in the state of Washington, University of Washington, Washington City. Uh, they have great aerospace programs, mechanical engineering programs, and they are, you know, uh, my daughter's going to college next year. If I lived in another state, she'd probably, uh, unfortunately, she wants to go away from college. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> kind of, uh, the, the, you know, you, you go was getting and getting, you know, it's really, really almost in the top ten right now. I think I think they're ranked 11. I know this. It's, uh, it's really a fantastic uh, uh, growth in that area. So, uh, uh, the infrastructure here is, is really well suited for what we want to do. Yeah, that, that leads into my last question, and I, I promise uh, that we've got kids from Raysbeck here, and I was struck by the comment that maybe you don't, uh, Chris, you were saying that maybe it's not necessary to be an aerospace engineer, maybe there are other avenues you can go. Maybe if people have quick thoughts about what these kids should do, what people who want to be involved in the space industry should do, what sorts of fields are opening up, where the big opportunities are. Uh, if you want to take a couple of minutes and talk about that, and then we'll go to your questions. Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I'd love to. I, I mean, I got into to space exploration because I found it inspiring and inspirational, and I read somewhere that aerospace engineering was the way to do that. Uh, and I, I, the, a lot of uh, the guidance that I give people who are studying this, and we've had uh, many interns uh, from Raceback and Planetary Resources, uh, and uh, since they started in high school, we haven't quite been around long enough, so they finished college yet. <laughs> we're getting there. Um, but I would say find problems that pique your curiosity that you enjoy solving, uh, that uh, really contribute to just anything. It's all about problem solving, whether it's the, the work of an economist, whether it's marketing, uh, or if it's electrical engineering. It really takes all disciplines, and uh, I think that's more of what we're seeing is that uh, businesses in space are becoming businesses. Absolutely. Okay, uh, we're ready for your questions, and, and I hope you got a lot of them, because we depend on you to, to really come up with uh, what you want to know about, about Seattle, about the space industry. Uh, so, please. Uh, hello, gentlemen. I'm a student from Washington State University, and this might actually be a good time to ask this question, because it may be related between your different areas of interest. So I do know from many spacecraft, uh, they have limited uh, freedom in how they can explore the solar system due to the limitations of propulsion and what fuel you can bring. So is it possible that taking advantage of asteroids and such for the resources, would it be possible to use uh, asteroids as a sort of gas station to provide fuel for uh, uh, propulsion and thus provide greater mobility throughout the, uh, the solar system? I think I'll take that one. <laughs> uh, uh, that's the idea. Uh, and it's something that, well, 
you know, it might not be immediately obvious that you can take uh, hydrogen and oxygen in the form of a water molecule. And you can't turn that into hydrazine, uh, which is uh, in the stuff that Aerojet uses in, in many of their rockets. But it's really about transforming how transportation works. And in the same way that we're looking at reusing first stages of rockets right now, we've got to continue that thought of how do we reuse the second stage and the third stage. Uh, how can we have services in Earth orbit where um, you no longer have to build a satellite that has a propulsion system that carries you from a parking orbit to geo. You can actually use a tug for doing that. And that tug uh, gets a large amount of its fuel, if not all of its fuel, uh, from something that is outside the gravity well. So that, that, is, that is actually the, the big opportunity that we see in space resources is uh, being able to use things like fuel, like oxidizer, uh, so you don't have to bring it up with you for the surface of the Earth. We've got so many questions that uh, if you want to direct it at a particular person, that's great. And, uh, and, and if, if people want to pile on, uh, that's great too. But let's try to, you know, keep things going because it looks like we've got about 10 people and about 10 minutes. So, go ahead. Just go ahead and ask and we'll repeat it. So there seems to be 
be certain areas that uh, investors don't want to put money into. Yeah, I, I'll be in the plug uh, actually for uh, another group that has uh, a lot of presence here in Seattle and Silicon Valley and elsewhere, and this is the Space Angels Network. And that, you know, not all space companies are working on things that cost, you know, hundreds of millions or billions of dollars. A lot of them are working on technologies that can be funded by angels who have identified uh, interest in small, small opportunities in space. And we're seeing a number of, of very active and successful companies that have come out of a single small investment from one or more investors, and Space Angels is an excellent way to do that. All right, thank you. Okay. Yes. Hi, I'm Dan Tynan from Guardian. Um, and this question is for anyone who wants to answer. Jeff Bezos, Yuri Milner, Paul Allen, Richard Branson, Elon Musk, all of these billionaires, instead of buying yachts, they're investing in space. Well, they're buying yachts, too. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're in space. So, why? Why? Speak for my generation, you know, growing up in, in the Apollo era and watching, you know, those of us who got, got to watch the Apollo um, landing real time. I was four years old, but I remember not necessarily Apollo 11, but the, the later landing. So it really it has an impact on you. And, and uh, um, you've heard Jeff speak talk about what, what drove his passion, um, which is which is being five years old and watching it, watching the landing. Um, it is, you know, it's inspiring. It's, uh, it's, it's something that sticks with you, and, and so if you do have the resources to go do something like that later in life, I know that's, that's why, he, why he found it, Blue Origin, and is committed to it. Um, it it's, it's about the passion, so. Sure, I can give a, uh, just, um, very similar story, Paul's a little older than Jeff, but, but the same kind of story as far as uh, watching, you know, the Apollo program and all that stuff. And then that combined with the fact that, um, that uh, he likes to take on tough challenges, he saw the tough challenge of, of getting to convenient and more affordable access to space as, as a way to sort of open up uh, this space domain for more entrepreneurial activity. Um, and, and the other thing that's interesting um, is that Paul actually originally got interested in computers and, and, and writing software and all that stuff, because he, he originally was passing up the space program, and that was, he wrote about his book. That was how he, how he actually got interested in computers and writing software. And then, and then along the way, this, this thing called Microsoft happened. But, but really, he's, he's always been absolutely fascinated with space and, 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 and opening it up and making it more, you know, for everybody, basically, to get it away from just access to the few to, to access to everybody. Frank, thank you. Uh, Sean Clinton, Space Entrepreneurs. Uh, it seems like each one of you on the panel has a vision for your company. I mean, if that's a million people living, working in space of blue origin, or the economy in space for limited resources, uh, any thoughts on the vision for the Seattle uh, space industry? I mean, what is that? What is a maybe a five, ten, fifteen year end game look like? I mean, is does some of you emerge as the next Microsoft or Amazon in the space industry? I mean, is it a bunch of thriving entrepreneurs or small companies? I mean. I guess we conclude there isn't going to be a launch site in Seattle. What's it like, maybe? What's your dream? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll take it at that. Um, yeah, that kind of dovetails actually the previous question. I mean, Fred and I have the devious rules about having to make profit, whereas I think these gentlemen have very long term visions <laughs> and, and what they're doing. And quite you frankly, better make I wish that I had. You better make profit, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> He's my answer. <laughs> It's like thank God for our industry because we're actually seeing this tectonic shift of, you know, it's the resources and the vision of these billionaires who made their money somewhere else and they're investing it. And I think there's very altruistic reasons they talked about, but really it's also a lot like philanthropy because it wasn't for these investments with these 10 or longer year returns. I mean, mining asteroids, I'm all for when they're doing planetary resources. That's a super long term business plan. You know, I think that is fundamentally changing the landscape of the industry, but it's also really happening here in Seattle. And so I think it is fundamentally transforming the landscape of the space industry in Seattle. And I think you're seeing a long-term commitment. These are young people, uh, relatively speaking, with, with significant wealth, and they're investing here in Seattle and on the West Coast. Um, 
you know, on the commercial side, you know, for us that do make profit, you know, we are also trying to transform these industries, and we had actually announced an investment today from uh, Mythical Capital in what we're doing that allowed us to buy a company. And we are really trying to change how we look at the planet, and we think that's going to be as big as Facebook or Google. You know, when everyone has access to the planet and can use it for whatever purposes. That is going to fundamentally change society. So these are big visions that we have here in Seattle. Speaking for all of us, I think they're actually as big down there as they are over here. I mean, the world's largest airplane, you know, fully reusable, crude space transportation, mining asteroids. I mean, it is really fundamental to this entire industry and quite frankly, the planet and society. So I think it's exciting. I'll, I'll just throw in a couple of points on that question and the previous one. Uh, one is I don't think you can constrain where the Seattle space uh, economy and industry is going to go. I think it's it's going to be innovative and creative and, and it's going to pop up in, in many different areas we don't even realize right now. But I think the other thing I'll, I'll bring up uh, about the uh, billionaires putting their, their investments into uh, uh, the space business, and, and this maybe is a little far out there concept, but National Geographic recently uh, had an article about uh, they've, they've determined there's a uh, exploration gene in our DNA coding and, and some people have this and you can get, you get your DNA mapping done. It would be interesting to see for these billionaires that are putting their money into space exploration whether they've got that exploration gene uh, because it is, you know, I think it's fundamental to human uh, humans that they want to explore and we've explored throughout history and, and space is the next place to explore so it's a, it's a natural thing for us to want to move in that direction and for uh, people to put their money in that direction. So I got the sign about a minute ago that I had one minute left but let's take the last question here. Okay. Make it a good one. No pressure. Nat, <laughs> Nat Seymour, Technical Graphics. I've been in space propulsion for about 20 years. I recently went into photography full time. Just recently worked for Fred before they before they added the rocket dime in the name. Um, so in front of the yard, I have to ask you gentlemen for engaging the public for product design for making sure clients feel like they're part of the experience. Where do you see the art fitting into your payroll? Is there somebody on staff who you have to be pretty pretty everybody in engineer? Somebody jump in. Where do you see art in terms of pragmatic uh, marketing graphics? Great video. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll start with one quick quick answer, which I, I think a lot of the recent uh, excitement and, and growth in the space area is because there have been some very incredible uh, media events, particularly some recent Hollywood movies that have captured national attention and, and have really created a lot of buzz and interest in the space arena. And those are helping fuel some of the growth we're seeing here and, and interest. You know, I think a lot of us on the panel got into the space business and we were just talking about you know witnessing Apollo uh, launches and landing on the moon and, and some of those exciting things we saw as youth and that's what at least personally steered me down a certain path and so I, I think it's a great uh, comment that there needs to be uh, more of that uh, media and more of that uh, communication and, and a lot of it through the arts to help create that excitement for the industry, which we, I think, today haven't had uh, as much as we should. Um, I, I have a, I agree with everything you said, I have a, another sort of way of looking at the, the arts issue, um, which is that uh, one of the things that's fascinating to me is the intersection of, of the arts and science. And, um, and the artist and the scientist. And, and we are kind of at a time in human history, again, as this happens, where, where the two come together. And there's that, the, the, the creativity and the, the seeking truth and the, the connection and the expression of truth. Um, whether it's, you know, it's, it's cosmology and, 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 and that kind of thing. Um, you, get to, you do get to this, this area where the, the artist is seeking truth and trying to express it. And this is different than commercial art kind of a thing. And, uh, but it's very similar to the, to the physicists and these, the, the, the people that are, um, that are the really, there, there may be some in the audience, I'm not one of them, I'm, I'm just a regular old engineer. But the, the people that are really seeking, and, and it's a fascinating field, and, and that aspect of it, I know, inspired a lot of artists in music, in, in um, you know, 
fine art uh, and all that. So I think I think you're on to something, and, it, and it's uh, it's something I've actually had conversations with with Paul about. I mean, it's, it's, it's so near and dear to him as well. And so I'm going to add another tourist stop: uh, the EMP Museum and Science, Museum, which Paul Allen has <laughs> created, and uh, <laughs> it is the perfect uh, fusion of art and space and science. Star Trek exhibit. <laughs> Star Trek exhibit, exactly. Not said. Thank you so much to the panelists for being here, and thank you for your great, great questions. Great.